Number 10, Boy Jones. What's more intimate than a stalker? Am I right, ladies? If there's one thing women have loved throughout history, it's having every second of their privacy being watched by some creepy man, right? No. I can only imagine it's been worse since the dawn of smartphones and social media. I just, that must be horrible. Well, as it turns out, there were some real creep wads in the Victorian era too. The boy Jones was a stalker of Queen Victoria, who on multiple occasions snuck his way into Buckingham Palace, one time escaping with a pair of the Queen's underwear. What? Arrested multiple times, but still somehow found his way back to the palace. But what they should have done was swap the queen's underwear for a pair of mine after a shift in the garden center I used to work at. Oh yeah, nobody's coming for you after sniffing those bad boys. Oh! Number nine, graceful words. This was a time when ladies were supposed to be ladies, and that means manners are on the table and elbows are off. Dresses were worn to not show ankles, God forbid an ankle or wrist bust out. I think more importantly however, or rather unusual that is, is that women were expected to talk a certain way. Good evening Mr. Barrows, you must excuse my tardiness, there was a dreadful man screaming at me because my ankles were shown whilst mounting my carriage. Your what was showing love? Oh you hurdle it, I can't believe it, excuse me, I must be someone else. I don't need to tell you guys how ridiculous that is. I say fly out the handle ladies, wear what you want, do what you want. Number 8, shots. Not the kind I like. Well, I don't know about you guys, but nothing ruins the mood for me and my lady like being fired upon. Yikes. I'd like to stay the night kid, but the automatic gunfire coming from outside is starting to get to me. See? All gangster impressions aside, things must have been that way for poor Queen Victoria as she was shot in her carriage in 1840. A young man fired two shots at her carriage. More attacks would actually follow in the coming years. It's kind of hard to feel that certain kind of way after bullets go grazing past your pretty face. The worst thing that ever happened to my generation was making sure nobody was home when you were studying with your boyfriend. I was too busy playing Call of Duty, but at least I never got actually shot at. You know what I mean? That's just a good thing. Number seven, expectations. All right, this one goes out to all the married ladies in the audience. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. I'm curious as to why you got married and what your expectations were. Did you marry your high school sweetheart and live happily ever after? Maybe you had a shotgun wedding and after one night at the saloon. Maybe you just really wanted to find a nice man and settle down, start a family, be a mother. I think any of those options are great, so as long as you have options. In Victorian England, you were expected to do the latter. Women were expected to get married and have kids, and that's about it, really. My question is, why were angles and wrists an issue, but giving birth isn't? What I mean is it's kind of a compromising position to be in. All I'm asking is that the girls get treated fairly and given choices and be allowed to show some ankle. It doesn't make any sense. You can look at her business down there, but you can't show an ankle. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a magician. Number six, double standard. Divorce sucks. It's no fun. The person you once loved and cherished is now the villain in your story. I love McDonald's and I don't ever want them to be the villain in my story. I love you guys. Gotta get those Happy Meals. Divorce is something that isn't new. Honestly, it was probably invented the second after marriage was. In Victorian times, men had the right to divorce their wife if they had committed adultery. Women could not. Well, if you refer to my last part, you know that men were doing more than a little window shopping when it came to women. When men left town for business, they would have hired the services of a woman who patrol the streets at night. No, I'm not talking about Batwoman either. So men can divorce women if they dare to do what they did on a regular basis. Yeah, that's that's totally fair, not, yeah, that's good, equal, absolutely, yeah. Number five, corsets. Nobody wants a waist bigger than nine inches, said everybody in Victorian times. I for one can appreciate the female form and the hourglass figure. It's admirable, sure, but, that being said, I, I don't think we need to go so far to keep the female form in shape. The corset's a little too much. Corsets were those chest tightening, gut sunking, push all to mince meat to the top of the pie apparel that went under every woman's dress or every fat dude in his 50s who wants to feel 29 again. I don't think I have to tell you why this is bad or uncomfortable. The human chest needs to breathe, and when something's that tight around you, well, you struggle to breathe. Uh, trouble breathing, fainting were not all too rare, especially in hot and humid climates. For my generation, you may recall Elizabeth Swan had issue with hers in Pirates of the Caribbean. And then she fell, and then Jack Sparrow caught her, and it was a good movie. But 
don't, the corsets, I just, I can't get behind them. Number four, foot binding. While not exclusively done in the Victorian era, it was started in ancient times and continued all the way up until the 20th century, thus includes the Victorian era. A Chinese fashion tradition that takes women's feet and binds them and squeezes them until they begin to change shape. Oh, poor ladies. Again, I don't think I need to tell you that forcibly changing bone and muscle structure in your feet just for fashion is a bad idea. I think you all know that. For starters, it doesn't look right. After years of binding, the shape of the foot drastically changes. Secondly, the health risk of doing such is not worth it. Oftentimes, toenails fall off or become infected. Ugh, gross. Bones break and pierce skin. It's a bad time all around. Thank God we stopped doing that, right? Jeez. Oh, thanks. Number three, lard wigs. Wigs have been around for a long time. If you're a fancy politician from Washington, you wear a powdered wig, singing Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to the Capitol building. Balding men, women, or really anyone can wear a wig. It's, it's really for everyone. What I'm getting at is it's been around for a long time and we've come a long way. Given enough time and asked to tell the difference, I probably couldn't. I, I, really, I really couldn't point out a wig if, if you showed me. So we're getting really good at it these days. That being said, in the Victorian times, wigs were quite common and were fashioned with a peculiar substance. Lard, yes. Imagine every day of the week without proper baths or showers and living in close proximity to the Thames River. And you take a handful of pig lard and just slather that in your wig to style it. Put a gross sound effect in there, just gross sound, ugh. Do you imagine the smell? This is the most offensive hair crime since frosted tips in the early 2000s. Those were a big mistake too, I gotta say. Not, I had them, but it was there's only one man who can pull that off. And he's in Flavortown, you know who I'm talking about. Number two, German helmets. 1914 was the end of the Victorian era and the beginning of the modern era. It's actually a very fascinating time. It's kind of like modern meeting the past, really cool. Well, fashion just doesn't mean civilian. Anyone who's ever spent time in the Marine Corps knows that they gotta look their best. Wow, Marines. The Empire of Germany was no different in 1914, and a lot of German soldiers wore helmets with an ornamental spike, like a Koopa from Super Mario. I know you guys have seen the movies, you, you, you've seen them. Except the main issue here wasn't an overweight Italian plumber jumping on their heads, uh, but the war and the enemy itself. World War I was fought in a lot of trenches, so it's kind of awkward when you can see a bunch of little spikes moving up and around the enemy's trench. It's also kind of dangerous to have an extra piece on your helmet as you can get caught in weird places like barbed wire. And yes, if you're wondering, sometimes they were used in the absence of a good melee tool. Yeah, you'd be correct, sometimes they did. You gotta do what you gotta do. Oh, brutal. Number one, French uniforms. More World War I, but it's still Victorian. It counts, I promise. While the spiked helmets were a very bad idea, they were shortly phased out. They learned their lesson. However, the French stood up and said, no, 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 I have a worse idea. Also, shout out to France. You guys get a bad rap for the war, but it's really your war. You guys rock the man. You guys are the best, love France. Anyway, the French uniforms were a little bit of a mistake. In a classic case of fashion over function, kind of the theme of this list, they wore very bright and blue red uniforms. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but bright blue doesn't exactly blend into an environment. Thus, it made French soldiers a very easy target. Everything's like gray, black, and brown, and you're just wearing bright blue and red pants. Yeah, you're gonna, you're not gonna make it far, Chief. Okay, guys, that's gonna wrap it up for me today. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe here for more. Yes, we love that. We're almost 150,000 subs, man. Let's get it. Let's get it, baby. Number 10, the hobble skirt. This is a bad idea written all over it. The hobble skirt, also jokingly called the speed limit skirt, was a dress with a very tight hem, making the poor lass who's wearing its movement, well, not having much of it. Can't have the wife running off from her home now, <laughs> even if that, you know, that meant the home was not a good place and men acted really bad back then. But no, you can't have her running away. Apparently though, some were so tight that it caused women to fall. And in some extreme cases, I, I can't believe this, those falls were fatal. What? Number nine, ladies wear. Okay, this is a general one, but ladies dresses and wear in general was just ridiculous. I mean, I mean those big poofy dresses, it just seems like ladies had it rough. When have they not? Wear a dress that's too tight or so big you struggle to walk around. Not to mention the fancies of dresses have wire, wood cages, and frames. Just making walking around more difficult because yeah, that makes sense. For me, anytime I wear formal wear, I keep an eye out for bathrooms. You never know when you need to go. 
However, I just can't imagine trying to squeeze the lemon on those bad boys. Whew, that would be difficult. To make matters worse, there are stories of women wearing just regular big poopy dresses and then getting in accidents at factories. And yes, it was gruesome. And yes, they didn't make it out. And no, there's no movies about it. Stop asking. Number 8. Muslin Dresses Honestly, I can see celebrities doing this today. Okay, so the female figure. It's sleek, it's curvy, it's gorgeous. Today a girl's got some options on how she wants to flaunt what her mama gave her. You go girls. But back then, well, not, not so much. Except for the muslin dress apparently, which I find strange at the time since seeing a woman's ankle could give a guy a stiff neck for hours, if you catch my drift. Essentially this was a dress that you had to wet first, like a, a gentle misting if you will. Yeah, weird right? And then you'd wear it out. Now for the summertime, this makes sense and honestly I might support this myself actually. See the curves, stay cool, however some stories tell us of women who wore this during cooler weather and then got sick. Fashion over function ladies, be careful. That's a silly one. Oh, 40 below, I better wear my muslin dress. Yes, I'm just gonna walk out. <laughs> Number seven, pestilence fabrics. Last time I was talking about the Victorian era, I mentioned a few points on fabrics with harmful and dangerous chemicals, which happened more than it should have. It shouldn't happen at all, really. It's kind of sad. Well, that wasn't the only fabric related issue that was out to get you back then. For example, wealthy people couldn't be bothered to do their own laundry. I hate doing laundry, I don't blame you. I'm not wealthy though. And sometimes would have them washed and taken away by launders who, well, wash clothes to the rest of the city. Being that clothes and washers themselves were poor, or that clothes were just mixed around regardless, well, that was an issue. There was a lot of sickness going around at the time, and, well, it was contagious. A lot of times these sicknesses would cling to fabrics, and when given back to their customers, well, they could very well come down whatever London was feeling at the time. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I, I, I think I'll just wear more of my dirty stuff. I'll just wear my underwear for six months straight. It was white when I bought it, not anymore, but it's okay. Number six, lead. Here we go again. Lead, just lead in general. It was used in so much stuff. Seriously, it, it, it's scary. Especially because they knew it was harmful. It wasn't a secret, they knew. Uh, I was gonna pick one leaded item, but I, I mean, I couldn't. I mean, seriously, I know this is a list about fashion, but it was involved in some clothes making processes, it was, it was in women's makeup, which that's also fashion, and it was in house paint, which I know that's not technically fashion, but it kinda is. Trust me, I used to mix paint before I was an internet comedian. I know the history of paint. Ask me your paint related questions in the comments below. I'm the guy you need to talk to. I mean, it was used in pipes too, and we drank out of those. It's just crazy. Now, it is one of those things that minor exposure to is fine, sure, but the thing was with fashion and beauty is that you probably would use said product every day, like the clothing or the makeup, and especially the makeup of the ladies. Lead poisoning symptoms include headaches, stomach pain, constipation, infertility, and memory loss. Yikes, that's not fun. We don't like that here. Number five, emo girl. All the forever alone people, raise your hand. Let me hear you roar XD. I like to joke around a lot and say I'm a lawyer, a firefighter, and the cutest guy on the whole wide internet. But if there's one thing I know, it's people. I like people. I love them. I spend a lot of time with them, and after hearing this, I've come to the conclusion that this is where the emo girls come from. I figured it all out. It's down to a science. I'm a scientist now. Do you ever get that feeling in your tummy on Valentine's Day because you know it's going to be another one alone? And you'll be forced to be on your own, and, and, and that means sad music and crying in your room. Same, it's, it's Drake's Marvin room for me. Well, single women in Victorian times had similar issues. Since women were expected to marry and have kids, single women who were also forever alone were pitied by society, which I argue is just way worse. Who, who, no one wants to be pitied. Ugh. Number four, gold diggers. She take my money when I'm in need. As she tried, but okay, anyway, back to the actual content. Well, not exactly. While today in a place like sunny California, you might see an older man with a woman who's half his age. Maybe he's driving a nice car, or she's got on the very best and latest from Louis Vuitton. Stylish, yeah. Most of us think some thoughts about what we might think is going on there. We can kind of be judgmental sometimes when we see things like that. However, looking through a lens of 2022 to Victorian times might make the women of Victorian times appear to be gold diggers, but in reality, it was because all of their financials were tied to their husbands, legally too. Which, if you can imagine, that system didn't work too well. What if your husband is broke? What if your husband is running amok with sultry lasses on the street corners? 
Like I said before, no divorce, but even if she could leave him easily, supporting herself afterwards was going to be an issue, especially financially. Number three, Birth Factory. Just pump them out. The faster the better. Quantity over quality, or just, just get them out. The use of birth control, as you can tell, was not a common practice. Anyone who's over the age of 25, ask your grandparents how many brothers and sisters they have. I'm willing to bet it's in the six to eight range. Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. A trend that would continue for a few decades after. Education is important, and I'll get to that in my next part. Women were simply expected to act this way. Maybe it was the sign of the times since the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Maybe the factories needed workers, I don't know. Which in case you didn't know, they used children as employees. Maybe not so nice. Unfortunately, that was when there was an issue, and there were many. They had no HR to go to, and that was the least of their worries, really. Number two, no school for you. No higher education for women. Banned from going to university. I don't think so, not very nice, no, no. Honestly, any society that doesn't want half of their population to go to school probably has a few things to work out. It's a boys club and they can only go to university so that they can learn to be smarter and be businessmen, so they can earn money and thus have the facilities to court a woman who really doesn't have a choice anyway. Women had jobs, not careers. And they were all the jobs that you can think of. The ones that were too feminine for men as women were too feeble to participate in a men's job, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm happy to say that in 2022, we showed them wrong. Chetty loves everyone. Just remember that, I love everybody. You go, girls. Number one, strict rules. Okay, so after a night in the bed sheets with the gal that you love, or maybe the one that you found, there's a good chance that nine months later, a smaller version of you two could be walking around. A byproduct of intimacy, if you will. This was always something I wanted to rant about, but I always found it strange how strict parents and teachers from this time were with their kids. You gotta brush your hair, bed made, and whatever you do, don't ask for more gruel. Please sir, could I have some more? Whatever that Charles Dickens book was, I think it was Oliver Twist. They made us read those books as kids, and I don't know why, because they're kind of boring. From the extreme military code ethics happening at home to the long days in a factory at work, being a kid was tough, man. Earning the punk rock blues of today. I'm just a kid and my life is a nightmare. Kicking off the list at number 10, skincare routines. For a long time now, having pale skin in Europe meant that you were among the wealthy because in the 17th and 18th century, this suggested you could enjoy the indoors. You didn't get sunburns working outside all day, aka wealth. Keep in mind, this was long before sunscreen was ever even a thing. So at the time, the best thing to wash your face with was something called chemical wash. That was a mighty wash. This thing packed a punch, that's for sure. This wash would ideally get rid of sunburns, pimples, ringworms, smallpox, scurf, or morphew. I don't even know what scurf is, but it sounds awful. I don't want it. And your skin afterwards would be pale and literally glowing. Thing is, all these foundations were made with old timey, horrible, poisonous recipes. One of these facial creams, I swear, I'm not making it up, was literally this. Steep the lead in a pot of vinegar and rest it in a bed of horse manure for at least three weeks. What? I'm trying to get rid of bags under my eyes. How am I supposed to steep lead? What am I, Walter White? I don't know how to steep lead. I can barely steep tea, let alone lead. Moving on, I'm upset. Number nine, natural or painted. Today the internet is full of makeup tutorials in every corner. Doesn't matter what style you're looking for, help is now available. You can learn how to draw on eyebrows while listening to a true crime story. You know what I'm saying? It's perfect. The makeup game is crazy, but back in the 1800s, you only had two looks to choose from, really. You had the painted look or the natural look. Natural was light on the makeup, more of a paste look than anything, almost like you're a Victorian painting, you know? One of those? But to achieve the lighter look, Europeans would use actual paint, like paint paint. Just lead-based paint. And the most important part of applying this is that you can't smile. You can't even move at all. Any emotion will cause the paint to literally crack. Again, that's why all these paintings are so serious. Madame X, the portrait of Virginie Amélie Avegno Goutreau, originally painted back in 1884. At first, Sargent made the woman's strap slipping off her shoulder. That was a little, you know, scandalous, a little oopsies. That was deemed too scandalous for the upper class society around him back in the 1800s. So John had to literally repaint these straps back on. Yeah, backlash was so strong, John had to move after he sold the painting. Guy left Paris because of spaghetti straps. What a nightmare. But this is what I'm talking about. You start drawing veins on pale skin, people would lose their mind. 
Love that pale veininess. Number eight, Thames Torso. The Thames River is famous for being a stinky, rotten, no good, very bad river filled with the most heinous refuse humans have to offer. That's right, love. It's awful, isn't it? Oh, it's bloody awful. So, to some, it shouldn't be a surprise that in September of 1873, a woman's torso was recovered from the river. Hold on to your barf bag, folks, because it's only going to get worse from here. There was also lungs, a right thigh, a right shoulder, and lastly, a scalp of the face, and, and, and it was attached, and it's gross. Ooh, they found that as well. Authorities did their best to reconstruct the body, but uh, this isn't a Malibu plastic surgery office. They even sat out the face on display in hopes the public could identify the victim. One man suspected it was his missing daughter, but a positive ID could not be made. Thus, we know nothing about the case. Number seven, the Gattins. In 1898, adult siblings Michael, Nora, and Ellen Murphy were on their way home Boxing Day after an entertaining day out. They made their way home after a dance had been canceled. And sometimes it happens, but they still made the best of it. And you know what? I respect that. Enjoy your life. Enjoy the afternoon. That's awesome. However, they never made it home. Their bodies were discovered in a grisly, bloody scene. I mean, really bad. Skulls were crushed, bodies were beaten, and someone had done in the horse. I mean, they, they shot the horse. That's crazy. No witnesses, I guess. To this day, nobody knows what happened to the siblings. It's really scary. <laughs> Number six, Edwin Bartlett. Edwin Bartlett, like many other people in the Victorian era, was in need of a good dentist. I can use one too. I need braces. I need braces. I'll be, be so cute with braces. A lack of dental hygiene made for many issues back then. So, if you take away anything from this list today, folks, it's brush your teeth and go see your dentist. It's important. Well, he went to the dentist because his breath had been so bad, he had to sleep in separate beds from his wife. He had so, he had so much buildup and gunk in there. It was that bad. Gross. For me, it's because I fart in my sleep, or at least so I'm told. That's what everyone says. I don't know. At the time, Mrs. Bartlett asked her husband to pick up a large portion of chloroform because that was legal back then. You just... Pick up some chloroform. Okay, sure. What a time to be alive. He later was found with chloroform in his system. A large amount. The missus somehow convinced the court that she was innocent. A study done almost 100 years later confirmed it was her. Well, at least maybe it was her. We're, again, still not sure because it was so long ago. Fine. Number five, corsets. I can't even imagine how hard it was to wear one of these. Like, I have no chest. I'm just a diving board. And already, this is a nightmare. I can't even imagine. The Victorian corset, okay. <gasps> Tiny waist, curves, look, the whole thing. Obviously, this was horrible for your body. Just looking at this, you're like, ugh. Your ribs would literally slowly deform, as well as your spine misaligning. But instead of talking about how horrible this obvious one was, let's talk about that corset duel from 1836. Yeah, have you heard about this? That's a real thing. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clement. She had to marry her uncle when she was 20 back in the 1850s, so surprise, surprise, she was a little unhappy. Weird, right? So since the marriage began, her husband, he was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, whatever. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun in life. Then he's like, ugh, what are you doing? Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she defied convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess, to a duel in nothing but a corset. How badass is that? To this day, it's not yet determined who won, per se, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks? Yeah, that should be a musical. Forget Frozen. I wanna watch this on DVD, let's go. Number four, Deadly Nightshade. Macbeth's soldiers used deadly nightshade to poison their enemies. And during the Victorian age, women would apply nightshade to their eyes, just so they look nice. Awesome, so this is horrible, let's talk about it. The pupils would become larger after this, okay? That was the whole point of putting poison in your eyeballs. The thing that makes deadly nightshade so commonly known is the sweetness of the berries. Have you ever been outside and you see a berry and like 30% of you really wants to eat that berry? Well, curiosity kills. Deadly nightshade can be found in Europe, Asia, and Africa. It grows purple flowers in groups of three, along with those inviting purple berries. Just two to four berries can kill a human being, so don't. When in doubt, just don't eat them. And the flower as well. Don't ingest this, you'll get poisoned. And also, don't put any near your eyeballs. In this century or the next. Number three, bustles. So while corsets are one nightmare, bustles are just an entirely new thing. Tiny waste wasn't enough, eh? Had to get big old dump trucks as well. These Victorian folks went hard in the paint. Figuratively and literally, I guess. Bustles were also known as the Grecian bent. 
Big old booty Ben, that's it. It came to town in the 1870s and it took the idea of wearing a cage as a skirt to just having the back part extend out. Ah yes, an update, an upgrade, I guess. Then the fabric was draped behind the butt. Hope you don't like sitting down ever, because that's obviously not an option. Corsets would move your organs around slowly, and bustles would slowly damage your back. So let's leave this one in the 1800s. I think that's probably for the best. Number two, red lead redemption. Look, I'm pretty new to skincare routines, but I'm trying, okay? I'm trying to get rid of these bags under my eyes. I'm trying to sleep and drink water, all that jazz. Back in the 18th century, those bags under your eyes were a lot harder to get rid of. Lead mixed with vinegar, this would make you look more pale. If I used this, I would literally be a ghost. I would just be invisible. I would, you would just hear a voice in a green screen right now. In the 18th century, that pale look was ideal, but this lead vinegar mix also smoothed out your face. So, what could go wrong, right? Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and arsenic. Those powerful three things you don't want anywhere near your face. Yeah, arsenic too, the same deadly poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. Just the worst ingredients in the 1800s cosmetics game, really. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has arsenic on its priority list of hazardous substances. Toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing today in this century, so I hope this is eye-opening. Sans poison eye drops, I hope it's eye-opening. And finally, coming in at number one, deodorant. What did people even do before Old Spice? You know, before that guy was born, how did we know how to smell good? What did we know how to do? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s, and it was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide, and it was stored in metal cold containers. That's just not, nothing like speed stick at all. It's not discreet in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't long until the first antiperspirant came along right after it. It was called Everdry, and it was always damp, ironically, and it would always burn your underarms. It literally would eat through your clothes. I think at that point, I'd rather smell bad. Like, let me have rashes, let my face look horrible, let the bags show. I don't, I'd rather do all that than any of this. This is horrible. Number 10, Jack the Ripper. If we were to pick a poster boy for this list, well, it'd be him. Jack the Ripper was the alias given to the unknown criminal with sick tastes. During a period in the late 1800s, there was a string of cold-blooded de-lifings that affected London, Victorian London to be specific. It got so bad that they were telling people not to go out at night in fear of the Ripper. Ooh, that does not sound good. His crimes were extremely graphic and violent and meant for a much more mature and suitable audience. Just to make things even worse, he was never caught or really even fully identified. Some of the theories say he was a she, he was multiple people, or even Prince Albert. They thought it was Prince Albert at one point. They, they really don't know. Oh, that's terrible. That's just awful. Right, love, I'll go out with you, but you ripper could be out. Number nine, Charles Bravo. Mr. Bravo succumbed to his illness in 1876. He had been poisoned with atimony, which at first when I read that, I thought it said alimony, and I feel like a lot of husbands died of that. That's a divorce joke for everybody at home. With atimony, which is a poison that works very, very slowly. Slowly enough that he would have known what was happening. Thus, he quite possibly knew who did it, but never never revealed who did. <laughs> At the time, it was believed to be a manual checkout, if you will. What's crazy about this case, though, is that it's like a game of Clue. The wife was having an affair with a doctor, so, you know, there was something there. There was also a disgruntled maid who all wanted a piece of Mr. Bravo. Mm, yes. The family fun game night conclusion was, it was the wife in the library with the candlestick. I meant the poison. She poisoned him. It, it, it was her with the poison. I th we think. That's the running theory. We still don't know. Number eight, beauty patches. 1800s beauty patches patches came in many different shapes and sizes. Take this portrait from 1755 for example. Joshua Reynolds painted Charles the Ninth, Lord Cathcart, rocking a pretty large beauty patch. The guy literally looks like the rapper Nelly. That's massive, it looks like a band-aid on his cheek. Whereas other fabrics used in the 18th century were much smaller. They were tiny circles, hearts, stars. If you found this, you'd think somebody was gearing up to go to an Arctic Monkeys concert. They were often used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue. Now the patches were dark black to make the pale pop, but the location of where these went also had purpose. A beauty patch in the corner of your eye meant that you had a lot of passion. On the forehead, that was meant to be majestic, and a dimple patch, oh, well, you're a cheeky one. That's uh, the scandalous one you are. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took notes on these positions when observing two parties from the 1800s. One party had patches on the right side of their face and the other had the opposite. That's like switching jerseys back in the 1800s. You're like, ah, this team sucks. 
Number seven, mouse skin eyebrows. Okay, Stuart Little, if you're watching this, skip to number six. You don't wanna see any of this, all right? Trust me, it's not good. Back in the 1800s, as I mentioned earlier, the cosmetic game was harsh, to say the least. The eyebrows too, they had a rough go. Eyebrows were completely plucked off back then in order to make the forehead bigger. Yeah, you need that 1800s five head. That's the trick, apparently. Imagine if I shaved my eyebrows off and then painted my face like pale white. Honestly, I'd do it for the clicks. I'd do it for you guys. This five head look didn't last forever, thankfully, but for a hot minute, it almost got worse. In the late 17th century and early 18th century, these leading ladies would shave off their eyebrows and then they would glue on mouse skin to replace them. Like a band-aid, only horrible and stinky. Since their face was freshly painted and the glue game was weak, they would have one shot only to stick these puppies on. You just gotta eyeball it and hope that it works and that it looks in the right spot. I don't know. You put them on too low, you're gonna look upset all day long. Eyebrows are angry sisters, not angry twins, okay? Remember that. Number six, lip paint. Red lips always lie, especially when you don't know that ammonia is mixed in with it. How jolly. Back in the Victorian era, the pale look, red lips, beauty marks, you were trying to look like a literal queen. That was the whole point. So women in the 1800s would either make their own compound themselves, which didn't work, obviously, or if they had some money, they would buy some. The main ingredient in these days were not ideal. Crushed up insects, which already could cause allergic reactions when applied to your lips, but the ammonia mixed in really put the nail in the coffin at that point. Ammonia and crushed bugs? What am I, oogie boogie? What am I making here? What am I plotting? Number five, Harriet Boozwell. Christmas morning, 1872, was a good morning for everyone waking up except Harriet Boozwell, who was found carved up like a Christmas goose. Oh God. The night before, she had attended a fancy Christmas ball, as you do back then, and she was seen leaving with a well-dressed, handsome man, a foreigner, most likely German, as witnesses report. She was found the next day with multiple lacerations, and uh, yeah, it wasn't pretty. The police eventually followed a trail of evidence to a German man in South America, but because of the man's pleasant demeanor and solid alibi, he was dropped as a suspect, even though his maid claims of cleaning a bloody handkerchief that night of her passing. No one else was ever arrested for the crime, and that was the end of that one. Oh yeah, the bloody handkerchief, yes, yeah, that was, um, that was my brother. I had nothing to do with that. Yeah, it was not me, sorry. Number four, Elizabeth Jackson. Surprise, surprise, another mangled corpse was found in the River Thames. Hmm, that's weird. This time, the lower half of a woman and legs. As the days went on, more and more parts were discovered, and after another bad glue and paste project, it was identified to be Elizabeth Jackson, a young woman who had left her home in shame of an unwedded pregnancy. Ooh, scandalous. Sadly, she ended up in River Thames and no one is sure who did it at all. Some claim actually it was Jack the Ripper and while it does make sense, experts don't all agree. Thus, it is another unsolved mystery. God, that's, why is it happening so much back then? What the hell's going on? God. Number three, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took an ax and gave her mother 40 wax and when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. That's a, that's a nice nurse. What a nice thing to say about a, ni a nice young lady. Maybe one of the most famous crimes ever, actually. In a nutshell, it looked like Lizzie had done it. It was a it was a closed and shut case. It seemed like a pretty concrete open and shut case. But yet again, somehow, she got off free. She claimed that she was in the barn when it happened, and then she discovered the bodies. Now, most of the topics on this list are a whodunit, but I mean, for sure this one, we, we can't be so serious to not ignore the facts here, right? I mean, she was the only person there who, who could have done it. Oh, well, unsolved apparently. Oh God, all right, she didn't do it. Number two, the West Ham vanishings. Just east of London between the years of 1882 and 1899, a few women disappeared and they were left in parks, or at least their bodies were. I don't know why that keeps happening. It's just, it's, 1800s is weird. And while we don't know very much about Jack the Ripper, we know even less about these cases as they've somewhat fallen into obscurity. Naturally, police thought it could be Jack the Ripper again, but it's also likely that it's not. I'm starting to think Victorian London isn't the safest place for a lady to be. I'm, I don't like this is going. That's all the information on that one. It was like, yeah, they died, we don't know who did it. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'll put that in. Number one, Carrie Brown. This one takes place in 1881 Manhattan. Carrie Brown was found deceased in a hotel room. A man named Amir Abi was arrested and spent 11 years in jail for the crime before being proven innocent and released. So what's so crazy about this whole thing? Well, given the same style, the running theory was that again, this was Jack the Ripper. 
even though this was New York and not London. So the question is really, who did carry in? And if it was Jack the Ripper, why is he in New York? And how many more did he really commit? In London and New York? Man, that's scary, dude. I don't know. Number 10, the pressure. As much as the royal family's existence is a complete sham, the power that is given to them by their adoring idiot public must reflect poorly on the nerves of the staff. Like it or not, which I don't, these losers are the face of an entire country. And so if you make a mistake while working for them, suddenly you've just spit in the country's face. There have been a number of instances where members of the staff have come forth with stories of what it's like to work for these middle-aged children, and every single time it's been embarrassing. Most of them are going to be sources of points on this list, but hey, you know, the pay's worth it, right? Number 9. How to Call the Queen to Dinner On June 3rd, 2011, a documentary was released detailing exactly what it's like to work as a royal servant. It details the hardships faced by members of the staff, but one stood out to me in particular because of just how utterly pathetic it was. In the documentary, one former staff member recalled how he'd called the queen to dinner by stating, your dinner's ready. Oh my goodness, how could he say that? Doesn't this loathe some worm know that the proper way to call baby for Dindin is to clearly state, Your Majesty, dinner is served. Oh, and you'd better not forget their bib, lest baby make boom boom. But hey, the bay's probably worth it, right? Number 8. No vacuums. One of the stranger rules that is inflicted on the staff is the demand that they do not use a vacuum cleaner until after 10 a.m. This means that when cleaning the entirety of that oversized eyesore of a palace, it must be done by sweeping until everyone is ready for their ears to withstand the atrocious assault made by such horrid machinery. Have you ever actually like swept a floor in your life? Do you know how long that takes? And in a house of that size? Well, there's being polite, but like, come on. Well, I mean, come on. At least the pay's worth it, right? Number seven, catering to their whims. These are slightly less defined, but it's generally well known that every single member of the royal family has their own peculiar quirks. As a result, every single royal aide must memorize the exact needs of a family member and conduct themselves accordingly. This has been famously catalogued in Margaret's human ashtrays, people who accompanied her solely to ensure that she did not have to think about where she was ashing her cigarette. Better remember which exact fruits these people like at which exact state of rottenness and temperature or you're out of a job. And yes, this also includes the dogs. There's a butler for the dogs. But hey, at least the pay is worth it, right? Number 6. Tactical Dinner Planning Maps To the royal staff, dinner isn't just a fact of life, it's an arrangement. Everything must be perfect every single time. And reportedly, that's still down to the little old thing of memorizing what everyone actually wants and where. As a result, there are supposedly literal maps that are printed out that must be followed to a T for every single dinner, or I presume someone will throw a temper tantrum. But hey, at least the pay is worth it, right? Number 5. The Terror of London If you're into serial killers and just a little goth or emo, I mean who isn't, then you know who Jack the Ripper is. If you don't, he was a serial killer who roamed the streets of Victorian England and killed multiple women of the evening. And what can be called the first, or one of the first, modern serial killers. Jack the Ripper, however, is one of the psychos who got away. No one is 100% sure on who the Terror of London was, however, that hasn't stopped people from theorizing on his or her true identity. No, not Queen Victoria herself, although there are some who believe he was a woman, which would explain how he got away so easily. However, another popular theory is that it was the Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor. While there isn't much evidence to support this claim, or any of the claims really, it is interesting and makes me wonder, maybe the royal was a killer? We'll never know. Number 4. Short Kings Unite even though I'm a semi-charming and moderately handsome internet host, I suffer from an illness a lot of men do. I suffer from shortness. When the Lord was making me, he just put a few extra drops of cute in the mix. <sighs> and then there was no more room for my legs to grow. 
I just see life from a little bit down below. Although, I own it, and thank god I don't have little man syndrome. All toxic jokes aside, Queen Victoria may have been a good fit for us short kings, as she was barely 5 feet tall. She's known for being a formidable queen, but when you're that short, it can sometimes be difficult to keep your stature. Somebody take me seriously! Number 3, Dollies. Okay, so maybe my Sailor Moon merch collection is weird. Maybe I just want to be a cute blonde Japanese girl with a short skirt fighting evil. <laughs> Can you blame me? However, something I always find strange, no matter who it is and who owns it, is a doll collection. Why? Just why? And it's never a couple. It's always a large collection. And tell me why anytime you go to visit someone and stay overnight, they always put you in a guest room where the majority of the dolls reside. There's nothing like a hundred pair of creepy plastic eyes staring you down while you're trying to sleep in a bed that isn't yours. Well, Her Royal Majesty had her own collection of dolls. Yeah, that's right. You can just imagine the kind of treatment these dolls received. It's said she had hundreds of them, and most likely wore higher quality clothes than most common folk at the time. Great, now my worst nightmares outnumber me, and they're dressed to the nines. Whew, dolls are just creepy. Number two, here comes the bride. Imagine being so powerful, so mighty, and influential that you create two western traditions. Sure, the Christmas tree is great, but I'd argue the white wedding dress is more. She wasn't the first to wear a white wedding dress, but she was the one that made it happen. There's a few reasons why, and the obvious one is flexing that royal coin, but imagine trying to keep pure white clothes clean in the past. My mom makes a mean spaghetti and meatballs, and I have a difficult time keeping those stains off my white t-shirts. Which, if you also ask my mom, is a bad color for me. I was a messy kid. That's why other colors at the time made sense. After all, there's no dry cleaning in the 1800s. At least not with modern machines and stain remover. Hey Alexa, can you add stain remover to my list? Number 1. Send Ludes. Despite being known as a somewhat prudent queen, apparently the queen had an eye for the art that was lewd. In one case, the royal husband and wife gave each other art. She got some nice work, and uh, he got some nice works, if you catch my drift. We all know how nudity and lewd imagery can be treated by those who wish to censor it. Queen Victoria felt the opposite and had somewhat of an appreciation for the human form, even commissioning a lewd painting of herself. At least lewd for the time, it was more like a wrist and ankles kind of thing, but you know. Number 10, moving in. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of Old Blighty, I think of royal prestige. London and Buckingham Palace, after all. That's what a queen needs. You gotta have a palace. Where's my palace? Although most people think of the queen living in Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria was the first of the royal family to do so. I'm not royalty, but I wouldn't mind crashing a few days there. Nice big place, servants, probably all you can eat. Man, she had it good. All that's missing is Wi-Fi. Move over, your royal highness, I'm moving in. Just gotta get my collection of Sailor Moon memorabilia. Number nine, Queen Jeans. No, not a nice pair of royal jeans. I'm talking about DNA and hereditary jeans. I've mentioned a few times on this channel how the royal family may or may not have been uh, inbreeding. Okay, who am I kidding? There was a lot of inbreeding going on. Sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, cousins, and of course, hey, step bro. Now, as lovely as that seems to some, unfortunately, crossing the hall to reproduce can have ill effects as inbreeding is known to have complications with birth and their offspring. Well, Queen Victoria may have been the first carrier of hemophilia B, a blood clotting disease. While not having it herself, it's thought she passed it down through royals related all throughout Europe. Tsar Nicholas II's son comes to mind. However, I feel like if we told the royals why people were contracting certain illnesses, they would still do what they want anyway. So, I'll just close the door. You guys can go ahead and do what you're gonna do. <sighs> Number 8. Breaking Tradition For men in Western culture, it has been a long time of bending the knee to propose to the woman that you love. Or so wish to swoon. Tammy Lynn, I don't got much, but I know I got this ring I found behind a Chuck E. Cheese. So what I would like to do is I Jim Bob Billy Habernathy am asking for your hand in marriage. So romantic. Anyway, bad jokes aside, you'd be wrong in thinking that's how it went for Old Blighty. When the young monarch met her cousin, Albert, the love juices were flowing. She knew she was going to have to lock him in and propose to him before he could get the chance. They were shortly married soon after, and as stated in her diaries, it seemed that the couple was truly in love, which for royals is kind of rare. Even today, it's usually men who propose to ladies, but all I'm gonna say is, ladies, I'm 300 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, and I put the toothpaste lid back on after brushing my teeth, so, huh? Huh? Number 7. 
Did you miss me? Queen Victoria was a leader. She held a lot of power and that means people sometimes got a little crazy and wanted to remove her from such power. So for Queen Victoria, it should be no surprise, however uncouth it was, but she had multiple assassination attempts on her life. A lot of which were people firing shots at her carriage for some reason with, with a pistol. I, and a lot of these attempts leading people to being declared insane. And one specific amateur who tried multiple times to end the royal and failed every time. Eight times to be specific. I feel like after the first four times when the guard saw this guy approach, it was like, oh, man, this guy again. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Anyway, all attempts to end her life failed and she became the second longest reigning queen. Next to Queen Elizabeth, of course. Number six. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree. I was honestly shooketh when I learned this, but you know that thing a lot of people do around the holiday season where they get a big green tree and they like decorate it because of the holiday called like Christmas? I mean, you might have heard of it. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. Bad jokes aside, the queen and her husband may have popularized the Christmas tradition of decorating the tree after sending trees to local schools and army barracks. An image of the family decorating the tree was also published that Christmas. I wonder if they popularized any other traditions as well, like your aunt drinking too much wine, and that one uncle, no matter how many times he's told, says something at the dinner table that would have him sitting in HR so fast that, well, he'd, he'd be sitting in the HR office for saying something like that in public. Everyone's got an uncle like that. Number five, Queen Victoria's name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks, then we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best. We call it Victoria Day, right? It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, obviously. Victoria's uncle only let a few people attend. Like I mentioned in part one, she had an isolated childhood with the whole Kensington system. That was no way to live. But even the day she was christened, trouble awaited. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria, and at the time, the name Victoria was not regal. It was a French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time, so she was immediately advised to change her name to something more traditional. But as our calendars can definitely confirm, she said, nope, I'm good. Victoria Day. Yeah, it's definitely Victoria Day. Number four, tattoos. I only have the one tattoo, but I've always wanted more. Just not so good with needles, you know? I got my eyebrow pierced and I fainted. It's a fun fact, I have a little scar there. Not great with needles. Some of the designs are so beautiful on tattoos, the amount of pain you all sit through, I'm impressed, honestly, mad respect. The tattoo craze really took off once Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, he went and visited Jerusalem. And of course he saw copious amounts of body art and was inspired. Inspired, we'll say, yeah. So upon his return, he was all about ink at this point. And the Prince of Wales, well if he has a sleeve, well then maybe I can have a sleeve, right? What's going on? It wasn't a sleeve, really, it was a cross. The prince got a tattoo of a cross in homage to the Crusades. So if you're gonna try and convince your parents to let you get a tattoo, just, you know, tell them the Prince of Wales did, right? You're just trying to be a royal. Number three, gym day. Believe it or not, there were around 200 gyms across Europe during Victorian times. Yeah, just like six good lives. You're like, what? what's this about? Even Victorian dudes skip leg day. How great is that, okay? It's not just you. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, they weren't motivating, and definitely not safe. None of those, definitely not. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class, obviously. Grab your pocket watch and blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing squats today. These machines also were not ideal. They were designed as antiques first rather than their purpose. Also, half of these look like saw traps. Like, are you kidding me? No way I'd bend my arm around any of these devices. No way. All those wooden wheels? No. I'll stay weak and brittle. Thank you. Number two, ghost photography. I had to look back. I don't like talking about ghosts. As if the reanimated corpses coming back to life while they were ringing a bell wasn't scary enough. Yeah, let's talk about 1800s ghost photography. The camera was a hot new invention at this time, so tales of ghosts and spirits were now easily believed. Yeah, obviously, when you have a photo of a see-through woman, you're like, I, that must be, that's pretty terrifying. A big name in the ghost game was a man named William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849 and Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister and at the age of 22 he was appointed as editor of Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. So far, so good. This British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a real spirit. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine a day where somebody being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize also poses for photo ops with ghosts. You're like, I don't, do we believe all of this or none of this? What's going on? This is so scary. And finally, number one, music for eternity. 
Before we wrap up this wild part two, I had to include perhaps one of the creepiest patents of all time. Patent numero 9,222,059. Yeah, the number is going a little bit higher. This one got me thinking. I wanted to end this video off on this note. I like this idea. Maybe, I don't know yet. Music for Eternity Systems. Okay, this patent is not from the 1800s, but rather 2015. I know, it's not Victorian, but when else am I gonna talk about this, really? The idea here is that you could stay connected to your loved one by using a solar-powered digital music player. The best part here is the patent details how surviving family members now have the ability to update, revise, and edit stored audio files and programming after burial. Yeah, next Rihanna album, no problem, I got you. There's a speaker in the casket and there's a headphone jack on the tombstone so we can listen together and then we can decide if we hate the album. That's creepy, I wouldn't do this. Would you want this? Sound off below if you'd want, you know, big shiny tunes playing for eternity after you die. I would do the Titanic theme song, just make everyone so sad all the time. Kicking off the list at number 10, Dark Dining. I don't know about you, but I can't eat in the dark. I need to see every single bite that I'm eating, okay? Call me crazy. Part of me wants to go to a restaurant where you can't see anything, but I know that I won't make it all the way through. I can't do it. I like, I have a thing. I have to just, I'm not blindly, what if it's not cooked? I don't know. Back in the Victorian era, dining in complete darkness wasn't just a date night. It was actually the best way to digest, or so they thought. That's why many Victorian era homes had their dining rooms set up in their basement. How random is that? Oh, do you guys have poker nights down here? Nah, just brunch. Kill the light. <laughs> what? How do you like your eggs? Turn off the light. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Number nine, Saved by the Bell. I'm sure you've heard about this at some point, but allow me to go into grim detail. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, everything bad, you name it, it was all spreading. Not an ideal time to be alive. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill, but with this came a dark trend. The safety coffin. Yeah, we got a safety, we had the safety dance, now we got the safety coffin, here we go. These coffins, I mean, God forbid you were buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again and exit said coffin. A lot of these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground and attached to a bell on the outside. So if a passerby or heard it, one, that would be so scary, but if they heard it, they would know something's up and they would help them out. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. For example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester, he passed in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his casket, revealing a layer of glass. Now, if anybody were to see condensation, he could then be removed. Patent number 81,437 was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868. It was an approved burial case, a real patent. This was a real coffin. This is crazy. This one had an air inlet, a ladder, and a bell. All three, there you go. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, he could ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save himself from premature death by being buried alive. Nice. You thought you died. Psych, climb this ladder. There you go. Good luck getting up. Now you're in an escape room. Enjoy. You only get two hints. It's like a little walkie talkie. Hey, uh, how do I get out of the coffin in room B? Number eight, no air. Now that song's gonna be stuck in your head. Jordan Sparks, a classic. Since we're on the topic of safety coffins, I had to include one more. Maybe two more, I'll never tell. This one is fascinating. The science involved here was honestly impressive. There was the classic wire and bell method, but the more sick people got, the more creative they had to become. Like for example, patent number 268,693, John Krishbaum's device for indicating life in buried persons. Yeah, an 1882 classic, we love this. We got the iPod Nano, they got the device O Life. Nice. Upon first glance, you may think this is some type of medieval punishment, whatever, but really this device detects movement whilst providing much needed air. Now you obviously can't have a hole in the ground or else rats will make your real demise much worse than suffocating, right? So John's device here, as per the disclosure details, is that if the person buried should come to life, a motion of his hands will turn the branches of the T-shaped pipe upon or near which his hands are placed. A marked scale on the side of the top indicates movement of the T and air will then pass come down the pipe. Once sufficient time has passed to assure the person is dead, the device can be removed. Yeah, imagine waking up with this in your hands. I wouldn't be calm enough to turn it and then breathe in a passive amount of air. No way, there's nothing passive about waking up in a coffin. Number seven, bad hair day. Okay, you want it messed up? Let's do messed up. Hope you're not eating any food right now, especially not eating in the dark. 
two red flags. Okay, the Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 had readers invested on this fateful day. Right on the cover, it read, a 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. Now at the time, that's not far off from average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case, was odd. Everyone wanted to read about this. This case was noteworthy. It was important that folks understood what took this young lady's life. Doctors asked the family if they can carry out a post-mortem, and lo and behold, they found a two pound, solid chunk of hair sitting in her stomach. Two pounds. That's what happened. That's how she met her fate. That's horrible. This ball of hair caused an ulceration of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. The woman's sister did note that over the last dozen years or so, she had casually been eating her own hair. So at this time, I say, if you know anybody eating hair, send them this link. It's not a good idea. Cut that out. Stop doing that. Number six, the Great Famine. Weird time to talk about a famine after the hair incident, but okay, here we go. Back in 1845, a potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on was no longer available. This was huge. This is bad history right here. A group of microorganisms wiped them all out, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law at this point and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people. This famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. Historical, definitely. Messed up, absolutely. Number five, cat attacks. If I had to pick, I would of course say I'm 100% a dog person. I got, I'm sorry, I grew up with two cats, I'm allergic. I grew up with two dogs, not allergic. Dog guy all the way, sorry. Cats are cool, but this next story just totally freaked me out. Back in 1870, this rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. How lovely is that? She had tons of cats, she loved all of them, and they loved her. Again, I'm allergic, so this, I'm already sneezing just reading about this story. It was the 1800s, okay? A lot of candles, everything was obviously extremely flammable, and disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out at this young woman's home. The cats were trapped inside the house. Now, they made it outside, don't freak out or anything, they all made it out, but by the time the two maids had kicked the door open to rescue said cats, they had gone full primal. They were afraid, they were freaking out. They were just scratching their way out through anyone and everything. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both sadly attacked by all of these cats. What a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives. I pulled my cat's tail when I was younger. I learned real quick uh, never to do that ever again. Number four, hiccups. Today we have many cures for hiccups, yeah. You gotta get scared or hold your breath or drink water like while you're doing a handstand. I don't know, everyone's got weird ideas, whatever. But nothing was as dangerous as the Victorian era hiccup cure, yeah. Ready for this one, don't try it. This one's scarier than a jump scare, that's for sure. In 1899, again, in the good old Merck Medical Manual, it recommended using chloroform to cure your hiccups. Uh? Yeah, just completely damage your entire nervous system and poison your kidneys, for sure. To get rid of hiccups, that's way better. This 19th century anesthetic was not a solution. Never try this. Continue scaring your family and friends. That's definitely the way we handle hiccups now. Number three, tapeworms. Back in the Victorian times, they really figured out the trick to weight loss. Yeah, was it watching what you eat, maybe counting your steps, maybe getting a gym membership, something like that? Nope, nope, and no way. No, it was way easier than all those things combined. Can you believe that? And you didn't even have to pull back on how much you were consuming. Doesn't this sound fascinating? What is this? Well, all you needed was a handy tapeworm. Yep, I don't have one. I don't know why I pointed. That'd be gross if I had one. Yeah, tapeworm. You know those things that can kill you today if you get one? See, the plan was if you eat a tapeworm egg, okay, it will later hatch in your stomach and at that point you could just eat anything you wanted because every time you ate, the tapeworm would also eat. So you could get your snack on while still rocking those Victorian skinny jeans, right? Tapeworm cyst pills or go for a jog. Your call. Number two, Victoria's reign. Queen Victoria's reign started in 1837 and it lasted until the queen's death later on in 1901. At just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819. Queen Victoria was fifth in line when she was born, so right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever get the crown. Then one by one, out of nowhere, all of her family members began passing away suddenly. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and grand father both died a week apart from each other. So by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old and already she was next in line for the throne. 
That's how fast it happens. So as if that wasn't already stressful enough, Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of before, it's, it's pretty awful. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from mates or family members, anything fun or social, you name it. Her mother did this to keep her pure, of course, to keep her the most pure lady. This system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every action, including who she can see or speak to. Victoria only had two playmates growing up. That's it. I'm like, hey, me too. She had her half-sister, Princess Fedora of Lennington, and the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoire. I mean, only three friends growing up, that's cruel. She shared a room with her mother until she was finally queen. Yeah, she couldn't walk down the hallway alone at any point. She had to always walk with her mother by her side, even to the washroom, that's crazy. Victoria has reflected on her childhood since, and yeah, she hates John Conroy for manipulating her mother, and she actually refers to him as Demon Incarnate, so. That's good, it's a nice nickname. Incarnate, incarnate. He's a demon, he's the worst. Let's just call him that. And finally, number one, royal enemies. Being the queen and all, a security team is of course needed at all times. And during her reign, there were multiple attempts to harm the young Queen Victoria. The first attack was back in 1840. It was a young guy named Edward Oxford and he attacked the queen's carriage. Just ran at it like a crazy guy. Obviously, and thankfully, nothing happened. But when Edward was later accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again, but this time it was two men attacking the carriage. And then in 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit the carriage with his cane. He was going nuts as well. Everyone wants this carriage. This is like the ultimate, no one's getting through this carriage, apparently. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook after all these events. Then again, in 1842, 1849, 1872, attempt after attempt, it was horrifying. But then things got a little worse with a man named Boy Jones. Yeah, this guy stalked the queen from 1838 until 1841. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. He knew a way in just to Buckingham Palace, which should never be a thing in the first place. And the weird part is here, Boy Jones, once he was inside the palace, he would hide under the queen's sofa, and he would also just sit on her throne for hours, just hanging out. Yeah, he would pretend he's Cersei Lannister and just sit on the throne for a minute or two. Think about life. Eventually, thankfully, he got caught, but imagine coming home and Boy Jones is sitting on your couch. You're like, what are you doing? Take that shirt off, get out of here. Kick it off the list at number 10, Smokey Behind. When somebody tells you that you're just blowing smoke, it means that you're lying, okay? You've now been given exaggerated information of sorts. Well, back in the 18th century, they literally had to blow tobacco smoke at your behind. Yeah, weirdest work break ever, I'd say. So why did we perform magician enemas back in the day? What was the deal here? Well, tobacco smoke enemas were used to treat quite a few symptoms, or they thought so, including a common cold. These enemas came in these fancy kits with a fancy rubber tube. It was all fancy because it was an honest medical practice at the time. It was done by legit medical practitioners. This is the funniest part. The idea was that the tobacco smoke could warm up a soon to be deceased body. The nicotine would stimulate your adrenal glands, jolting you back into good health. The best health, might we say. And the way they would do it in the mid 1800s was by just blowing smoke and just waiting, seeing what happened. We're figuratively and literally blowing smoke. That's the origin of that saying, fun fact there. Imagine doing that today. Like, hey, I think I dislocated my shoulder. What do I do? He's like, hey, one sec. Number nine, alarm clocks. While the medical world was one threat in Victorian times, apparently so was the technological side. Who knew? We obviously didn't have reliable alarm clocks back in the 1800s, obviously, but we did have jobs. So in order to get up on time, lamp lighters or knockers would come by and tip you off. Yeah, they would just yell in your window and just alarm. That's how you'd wake up. A man would yell into your window and smack you with a stick. Legend has it a young man named Sam Wardell, he got a little creative with his wake up calls. He needed more than a lamp lighter at 5 a.m. So he would Tony Stark this alarm clock gadget. He would use wires, a bunch of stones, all that unsafe stuff. Then at a certain time, stones would fall to the ground, of course, waking him up and presumably everyone else in the building. That would be alarming. Well, Christmas Eve, 1885, tragedy unfolded. A few friends had come over for a holiday visit, so Sam had to move some furniture around, rightfully so, to make room for you know windmills and break dancing, whatever they did in Victorian Christmas times. The next morning, he forgot to put things back in the small apartment, and the obvious happened. The rocks then fell on him while he was asleep. Yeah, that probably doesn't feel too good. I thought iPhone alarms were jarring. I take back everything I've ever said. Number eight, relaxative. 
Okay, so right off the bat, the Victorian era was a little messy. I'm sure you've gathered this by now here on Bumblebee. But these messy new illnesses were putting lots of pressure on medical practitioners, so they were desperate for these new treatments. We laugh at Victorian medical treatments, but they tried, okay? They at least tried. They also achieved many medical breakthroughs as well. But when it comes to handling chicken pox in the Victorian era, well, that wasn't one of them. That was not our finest hour. Chicken pox in the Victorian era was being treated by using laxatives. Yeah, let that sink in for a moment. I have chicken pox, what should I do? Well, try some laxatives. Yeah, folks would slam some castor oil and then, ready for this? They would get even more sick. Who would have thought? You thought you were uncomfortable before, castor oil, yeah, chug that, and then now you're even weaker, now you're dead. Number seven, backed up. Let's say it's the Victorian era and let's say you're constipated, right? It happens, you know? Well, bad ideas will most likely follow, if you didn't already guess that. According to Merck's 1899 medical manual, small amounts of strychnine were prescribed to those who were constipated. Yeah, the strychnose nux vomica was thought to better the gastric functions. Even a small amount of this stuff would attack your respiratory system. You'd contract, you convulse, it's horrible. It'd be a painful way to go out. It's much, much worse than being constipated. Any day. I would much rather be constipated than any type of strychnine, are you kidding me? Number six, leeches. I grew up with hearing problems. I've been around the block with earaches, ear infections. I had ear tubes numerous times, all that jazz. So I feel really bad for the folks in this next one, okay? I hear you, pun intended. In the Victorian era, medical practitioners would say to use leeches for your ear infections. That's the number one trick, they don't want you to know. There it is. Once they're attached to you, the idea was that they can numb pain while at the same time providing proteins and peptides to its host. So on paper, again, the idea made sense. But the science didn't quite follow, did it? It wasn't entirely hopeless though. Recently in 2004, the FDA reintroduced leeches to the medical world, yeah, because their bite can break up blood clots and induce blood flow. So it's not entirely hopeless. We've talked about leech collectors on this channel before, so of course we have to talk about more of the science that they were hoping to achieve with it, right? Also, I worked at a retirement home when I was 16. I thought that job sucked. Imagine being a leech collector? No way. Number five, walking rules. It just, it does, I don't even know. The hits just don't stop coming with these weirdos. Okay, it's a staff rule to never walk down the center of any corridor because it might wear down the material. This is something that the staff is required to do. I, I love it. Not only that, but whenever the ruler is in any room, if they're standing, you're standing. You can only sit when they sit. This just go this goes for everyone. Why? Why does this matter? What have these people actually done to deserve this respect? The the pace absolutely worth it, right? Number four, food. I cannot imagine cooking for the royal family. I think I would actually rather just die. Apparently, anything that could even potentially cause food poisoning just cannot be on the menu. So, no shellfish, basically nothing from the ocean. Uh, this doesn't just go for the royals either. As former chef Darren McGrady described his role pertained to ensuring that the diets of the queen's dogs were as healthy as possible. Not only that, but he apparently was even responsible for selecting the carrots the queen would feed her horses based on length. Because if it was too short, the horse could nip her finger and give her majesty an ouchie. Ooh. But hey, at least the pay is worth it, right? Number three, don't be seen or heard. Despite being the only things that are allowing these psychos' lives to run properly, the expectation levied on the royal servants is simply that they just must be invisible. Think about everything I just mentioned. Now, think about how you have to do all of this without being seen or heard. No complaining, or they might start to think that you don't like your job. Of course, if you hear them say anything, and you will, you better not remember it, or you'll be a traitor to the country. And then you could sell their secrets to the press and make thousands, but you really wouldn't want to do that because, I mean, think about how much money you're already making with this good job that you have. Right? Number two, dealing with King Tampon. Not even the hardest thing to write on this list by a long shot. Yeah, King Charles has been reported to be an absolute 
nightmare to work for during his career. One report claimed that when he lost a cufflink in the bathroom, he supposedly smashed a sink to pieces in his quest to find it again. Another report claims that he demands his post hunting snack be soft boiled eggs. But since hunting trips are, you know, difficult to plan exact times around, the staff will make eggs every three minutes during the half hour that he's generally expected to return and just throw out the ones that have gotten too cold. If you don't believe me, look at the footage of Chuck gesturing for the aide to move stuff off of his desk. Look at how pathetic this man is. Really sear it into your brain exactly how worthless of a human being he is. Now call him the king, you peasant. But hey, the, the pay's good, right? Number one, the pay. You knew where this was going, but you probably didn't know exactly how much. The average royal servant makes around 1,800 pounds annually. That translates to roughly 20,000 United States dollars and 27,000 Canadian dollars. Way below living wage. I have actually, and I am not being hyperbolic here, I have worked dishwashing jobs in downtown restaurants that have paid far better salaries than this. I know they get to live on the premise. I know they get free meals and I don't care. Selling your life away to live for the whims of a bunch of incestuous old rich white people in the world's most opulent retirement home is one thing, but selling it for cheap is too much. The work and training that these staff members have to go through is insanely rigorous. They are living other people's lives as a profession, and they are being paid what is absolutely next to nothing. I don't care how many cute little handouts Meghan Markle gave her assistant or whatever. This is inhuman, and it is just disgusting.